Italianite ryegrass, annual or perennial? Annual. You know what I call it? You said ryegrass. You know what I call it? Job opportunities. I'm a weeds guy, right? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, we all are familiar with that. And what, what she's alluding to is uh, ryegrass uh, thought to maybe uh, help remediate some of these fragile pan soils. Uh, Dr. Mur Murdoch is working on that, him and some of his other colleagues. And he may be on to something. And if there's anything where I'd say I would compromise this weed here to help that benefit, because what we're talking about, what he can do, if that is true, if it holds up what he thinks it will do, he's, you're making a significant change in agriculture here for Kentucky, at least in grain crops. So there are some benefits to this thing. And I always say the good guy, the bad guy, because you know what? There are some benefits, as Dr. Murdoch has pointed out, in some of his work, but there's also some drawbacks. And some of these drawbacks are pretty significant. Um, it gets in the wheat crop. It spreads real easily in that crop. It's the most competitive weed that we deal with in wheat. One plant per square foot will reduce the yield of wheat by as much as 4%. That's competitive, folks. That's a, that's a yield robber. Anybody here deal with ryegrass on their farm or clientele? It's yeah. been a long time. Hard to get rid of. It can be. Now, in the first year or two, the, the, the a vast majority of your seed will die back, but you may have a few of those stragglers there for another year or two, or it can be around. What the, the rotation that we typically use is the corn, uh, followed by a wheat, then double crop soybeans. And that's a great environment for this thing to kind of get a toehold, if you will, because ryegrass can get into that wheat crop and combines do a great job in spreading that ryegrass. Uh, so that's another, the weedy nature of this plant is, is a pretty big challenge for us in trying to develop management programs. Uh, the one thing that, that it, is probably second to none is its capabilities of developing resistance to herbicides and if you follow what herbicide resistance globally the ryegrasses are, are probably the greatest menace that we're dealing with uh, as uh, herbicide resistant weeds yeah I felt are all ryegrasses the same like you got a king variety and you got this variety and you got that variety there are different varieties and to be honest about it, I'm not sure I can tell you. There's so much confusion about the taxonomy of ryegrasses in general, and even taxonomists don't agree with themselves. I told you, I asked you, is this a perennial or an annual? And everybody says annual. Technically speaking, I think this thing possibly could grow as a, a perennial. But here in Kentucky, we don't, we just say all, all Italian ryegrasses, they grow as annuals, okay? But I think there are some differences amongst the varieties. And that's another thing that Lloyd is looking at. I, I really give credit to Lloyd. And he's being very, very thorough in what he's trying to find out in uh, using this plant here to help remediate those uh, fragile pan soils. So at any rate, it's a weedy natured plant, one that we have to be mindful of and when we're trying to control it. Controlling it in the wheat crop during that rotation is of the utmost importance, okay? for managing this weed right here. Uh, the title of my talk is this pre and post emerge control of tanning ryegrass and wheat. You know, when y'all were on the wagon coming this way, directly that field directly behind the greenhouse, on this side of the greenhouse, you'll see it ryegrass intermixed among some of the plots. That's where a lot of this data, this, this data is based on some of that work that we're doing there. We've started about five years ago making comparisons to some soil residual chemistry that was just being looked at. Well, I had the opportunity with about three different companies trying to develop this uh, a database for managing ryegrass and uh, things like products like Zidua, Anthem, Fierce, all those have peroxisulfone in them and have uh, chemistry. Well, let's talk about that chemistry. If we can 
get it up here. The chemistries that we included in this, this study, all in, highlighted in yellow, are all soil residual herbicides. We looked at Zidua, which is BASF product, uh, with this peroxisulfone as an active ingredient. It's got this number 15 tagged beside it. What's that 15? Does anyone know what fit that number means? It's the, it's the class of chemistry that, or it talks about the site of activity. Peroxisulfone is much like dual. You're familiar with dual or some of the acetylchlor products like harness. It's in that type of chemistry, and that's the, how it controls the plants. It inhibits the long chain fatty acids, but the main thing to understand is in that, that 15, it's just like, much like the, how dual will control plants. That's how this chemistry operates as well. Next one down is fierce, and I've highlighted our asterisk fierce here because please understand, fierce amongst all these things, even though we're studying in wheat, it's not labeled yet. They're working on developing a label, but for the current time, FIERS does not have a label. And the reason being is that the ingredient here, this flumioxin, is Valor. Valor is undergoing a review right now. And uh, basically, you know, they're not going to develop any new labels until their review with EPA is completed. There's nothing wrong with the product. It's just that it's scheduled after so many years being on the market. It's scheduled for a review, and that's what it's doing as a result of that. Fierce is not labeled in wheat. We looked at Anthem Flex. Again, it's 15. Carfentrazone is the number 14 uh, chemistry. Do you know what that 14 means? What chemistry is that? PPO inhibitors. Valor. That's what flumioxin is. Valor. Okay. AIM, carf carfentrazone right here. All those are uh, PPO inhibitors. And that chemistry, by the way, this is the first of the chemistries that we've ever seen used in wheat, the PPO inhibitors. Axiom is uh, flufinacet, which is, again, another one of those look-alike dual metolachlor. Uh, with metrobutin or syncor, that's a triazine, okay? You kind of see where I'm going with this. As I'm going down this list, it's lots of different modes and sites of action that we're trying to incorporate into this mess. Uh, fierce, or excuse me, finesse has chlorsulfuron and metsulfuron. Those are ALS inhibitors. That's what that number two means. Okay. Prowl, pendomethylin. Y'all familiar with that chemistry? That's the kind of the root inhibitors. It causes bottle brushing of roots of plants. Okay. It's a number three. Uh, Axial XL has got the phenoxin, or number one. One. That group one is ACC and ACCase inhibitors like uh, Fusilade, Select, and that type of chemistry. Okay. There you have it. This is what we looked at in terms of. Now, by the way, you might, for those of you who know quite a bit about what other herbicides are out there, we've got things like Osprey and Powerflex that are uh, pretty good herbicide and the post emergence as well but we didn't include them here because of the interactions you can sometimes find uh, when you top dress nitrogen in the spring if you apply those herbicides too real close to the time you top dress you can injure wheat and we didn't want to have to go through that splitting the different rates and timings and whatnot so we left those out and this included axial okay all right nothing comes free guess what? Controlling ryegrass is expensive. You're smiling. You know what I'm saying. Zidua, Fierce, Anthem Flex, all you're looking at anywhere from the low teens to over $20-some dollars an acre. Overall, you're probably, if you've got ryegrass, you're going to spend anywhere from about $15 to $20 an acre if you've got ryegrass. The cheapest one in this thing was $8.25. Finesse. Keep that number in mind, okay? Prowl's 15. I thought that's a little bit pricey for Prowl, but as you'll see a little bit later, that is, you're probably paying an awful lot for what you get. And then Axial XL is about $19. Okay? Not cheap. 
not cheap because these guys, if you're growing wheat, you're probably not spending much more than $10 an acre. <clears throat> if you look at the timings here, and I, I do want to emphasize, when we started this study, none of those products, these uh, proxysulfone products, were labeled. So we were just kind of going by what the companies were studying at that time, and when we started the study, that's the way it's going to be. Since then, they have redone their labeling for the timing of application. won't go into the details, but just to stress that in order for us to make these comparisons for these different products right here, we're uh, spraying them all seven days pre-plant, okay? Seven days prior to planting, we apply the product, seven days later we come back in and, and plant. Looked at Axiom in this case, application timings is two leaf wheat um, to one leaf ryegrass, okay? Two leaf wheat, one leaf ryegrass. You know what that is? That's like going out and okay, it, it's probably about two o'clock, maybe 2.30 in the afternoon, it's going to be time to spray. It's just a narrow, narrow window. You know, you just, you kind of, you got to make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle fit, fit together so you don't have a problem down the road with any injury. Finesse is a pretty broader window. It's after planting and before the weed emerges. That's a, you got a few days there for uh, determine when you can spray uh, finesse. Prow is another one of those post emergence. One leaf to, to flag leaf of, uh, of wheat, but before the ger uh, ryegrass germinates. Prow, like even peroxisulfone products, Prow does not control emerged ryegrass or any emerged wheat. It's a pre-emergence product. Controls it when those plants are starting to germinate uh, as a young plant in, in the soil. Axial XL, wheat has to be at two leaf to boot stage. Ideally for ryegrass, you want it to anywhere prior to three tillers. So that's a pretty broad window for timing for post here. Got a little bit of lead the way with there. Okay. To the data. Okay. The first two years we didn't have, uh, we didn't include uh, Anthem, Axiom, Finesse, or Prowl. The last two years in this study, all of these products were compared, okay? So we're trying to look at this as a multi-year study, looking at Zidua and Fierce. Those are the two products that we had enough data for all four years. And if you look at the numbers there, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, okay? Does that sound familiar? You know, I, as a weed scientist, I'm trying to promote the use of soil residual herbicides, especially in soybeans and corn. Now we're looking at wheat and we're looking at soil residual herbicides and how they react and respond when trying to manage in ryegrass. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And that, unfortunately, like it or not, that's somewhat what we deal with when we use soil residual herbicides in other crops. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. <clears throat> okay. Out of the, all the chemistry we, we studied here, the two that probably I would have to say seem to be not perfect, but probably pretty decent out of the group was either Anthem Flex or Fierce. Remember, I'm going to emphasize, Fierce is not labeled yet in wheat, but it's, it's numbers, while they, you know, you had some, in, in this case, uh, that second year study, a 60% control of ryegrass, nothing to write home about. But most of the others were ranked up there 80% or better. So that, uh, that looked pretty good. What was fear? y'all remember what was in fears? Valor and Zidual. You know, when we looked at these products over there, and we've done a lot of work with Valor. And Valor in wheat can be an iffy at times. You can get injury. And this particular year, especially this year, we've had quite a few uh, days that were wet and cool, and uh, had quite a bit of injury with with fears. We didn't, and, but that was the only time we've seen it throughout all the studies we've got that had that, that significant of injury. We're a little bit surprised and disappointed, but in terms of ryegrass control, <clears throat> I felt like it was a little better, a little more consistent than some of the others. Okay, 
that brings us to post emergence remember I said axial was the one that we used here we took this and we <clears throat> we just chose to look at the fall sprays of axial and also looking at a spring application now I've probably have talked more about using spring or fall applications in most years and if you look at the data here fall and spring both of them worked and they probably worked adequately that second year it was like 95 percent as opposed to 90 percent on the spring there's while it wasn't statistically significant there's a slight trend that maybe you're going to see some uh, spring applications with uh, with axial XL not as good as fall, uh, fall sprays but more consistent by all means it's more consistent than the solar residual products okay all right we've tried to kill the right rat we're not now we'll use that one thank you we've killed it the best we can any questions or comments yeah Real good questions. You all hear this resistance to the group one and group two. Group one is ACCH inhibitors, group two is the ALS inhibitors. They, uh, in terms of being in Kentucky, uh, we have had both. Actually, in Kentucky, we've had ACCH, ALS inhibitors resistance, and glyphosate resistance. Not all in the same plant, but we have <laughs> But it's, we've had resistance to those three chemistries. The good news is they're very isolated, and to my knowledge, uh, we, did, we just haven't seen any of those resistances pop up and manifest themselves as being a problem here in recent years. Now, I'm not, I'm not so bold as to say we don't have to worry about that because our good friends to the south of us, especially in Mississippi, are fighting the resistance to all three of those chemistry I, I just described. And these soil residual herbicides I'm talking about here are pretty key to helping them manage that resistance. And part of my strategy is when I started this study back five years ago, my goal was, you know, we want to limit the development of any resistance to ryegrass because we know it's prone to developing that. And so far, we've been pretty lucky. We've, with some of these resistances have popped up, but they've never really gotten a toehold to where they're on lots and lots of acres. Nothing compared to like it was in Mississippi and Arkansas. Okay? Good. Folks, I've enjoyed it. You're my last wagon. Thank you so much. Appreciate it very much. Take care.